Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and hopefully my voice holds up. We had a big night last night, but uh, it was it was well worth it. <clears throat> I just wanted to say just what a great experience this has been uh, coming here to Pitasacaba and meeting all of you and being, seeing this university. I'm just so impressed with with the quality of the students and the faculty and, and your institution. So thank you for, for having me. Uh, hopefully the story I have for you today is interesting. I know not many of you work on Potato. Uh, a few of you I've met are, and I'm excited to, to see where Potato Breeding and Genetics, where it takes off here at uh, Salki. But um, I'll also be touching on aspects of polyploidy, and there's quite a few of you who work on that. So um, thank you, I may need that. Uh, so here we go. I'm, uh, as, a, as you just heard, I'm the leader of the potato breeding program in my state, a uh, public breeding program in the state of Wisconsin. So uh, there's uh, the arrow pointing to Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> potato is a very important crop in our country, and uh, every one of these black dots, there is someone like me, a professor at a university, uh, or a federal institution who is leading a public breeding program. So it's quite a significant investment by our country in public potato breeding. Uh, the state of Wisconsin has 25,000 hectares of potatoes per year. Um, and uh, that actually accounts for 7% of our country's production, which does not seem like a lot, but that's actually the third most uh, in terms of the ranking of our states. Uh, the two state, Idaho and uh, Washington state, account for almost half of our country's production of potatoes in Wisconsin, although it's only 7% is number three. So we do have an important role to play in our country's uh, potato industry. The distribution of how potato is used in our state, about 15% of the production is used for seed. So that's uh, in, a special, in a geographically isolated part of our state, away from the main part of the, uh, the state where they produce potatoes for human consumption. And about half of that is consumed uh, in the fresh market. And the other half would be processed into um, various products like potato chips or french fries, for example. When I say I lead the potato breeding program, I actually lead about five potato breeding programs because we have these different market types and they're distinct in their appearance and in their culinary characteristics so you really can't interbreed them uh, without uh, it being something of a long-term back crossing, modified back crossing idea to try and come back to the type that you're looking for. So the three main types that we focus on in my state and around our country are shown here. Um, the upper left is the uh, elongated russeted potato, which is used for french fries and also for baking, which has a mealy texture. The red skin with the white flesh is used for mostly fresh market, but also canning. It has a waxy texture and a higher moisture content, so different uh, characteristics. And then the lower right corner is the round white kind, which is uh, bred to have a high dry matter, low sugar content. It's used for making potato chips. And because we have been breeding these categories for quite some time separately, if you say take a set of genetic markers, which I'll talk more in a minute where those are coming from, and do something just like a PCA, you can easily see the genetic differentiation of these groups. Okay, so um, potato, of course, comes from uh, your continent, South America. And uh, this is a, a figure taken from a colleague of mine, David Spooner, who's a taxonomist at uh, the USDA in uh, situated in Madison. We're fortunate to tell that the secondary gene pool is quite extensive. There are many wild species that can be used for uh, integration of useful traits. And so if you say take a, a figure like this and, and count the number of uh, species in the genus Solanum, you can see that the origin of diver the, the center of diversity in the presumed uh, site of domestication is in the Andes, Andean highlands of um, Peru and, and around there. Uh, all these different species have a basic chromosome number of 12. In, uh, in the Andean region, there are both tip, diploid and tetraploid land races that are still cultivated to this day. Um, the only other place in South America where there are believed to have been a very ancient domestication or redomestication process would have been in the temperate uh, latitudes of Chile, which are only tetraploids. So there are no diploid uh, land races from Chile. When the Europeans came to South America, and 
presumably brought all the potatoes that they could get their hands on back to Europe. They probably would have brought the, both the diploid and the tetraploid, but we know from molecular studies that uh, apparently only really the tetraploid Chilean germplasm made a significant contribution genetically to the Euro modern European and hence modern global uh, uh, germplasm. So U.S. germplasm is derived primarily from European germplasm, uh, as is uh, the germplasm in Asia and other parts of the world. And the presumed reason for that is the daylight adaptation, that uh, the potatoes from temperate latitudes in Chile would have been already adapted to some of the same conditions that they would have experienced in northern Europe. And so that's probably why it was the tetraploid uh, Chilean group that contributed primarily as opposed to the more tropical germplasm. Uh, so we've known that for a long time. Uh, there's some interesting, a lot of very interesting work uh, that's being done now with next generation sequencing. This is a figure taken from a recent paper coming out of Robin Buell's group at Michigan State University, which kind of shows this hierarchy with some nice color photos of, of the different kinds of potatoes. So down here at the bottom of the figure are some photos of uh, wild diploid species, which are tuber bearing. Um, they have a, a picture of the proposed progenitor of cultivated potato. I would say that's not really a settled issue, but uh, then we can see the, both the, the diploid and the tetraploid types that are uh, so-called uh, group indigenum from uh, the Andean region. We have the tetraploid uh, group chilatinum that comes from the temperate uh, region of Chile, and then we have our modern types, which are all tetraploid. So uh, we have a reference genome. We only have really one, we only at this point only have one de novo assembly of a genome from uh, the tuberosum type. And originally uh, they tried to assemble the genome of a heterozygous diploid known as RH. And that's this uh, kind of round potato which looks more or less like a modern potato does. But they were unable to do that, make that assembly work, I think both from the computational and from the sequencing technology in 2011, so uh, they got their hands on a doubled monoploid, which looks like this. It shows severe signs of inbreeding depression um, <clears throat> and uh, has a, a very uh, weak, weak vine. In, in potato, this is what you would, in potato we call things by their proper uh, terminology, monoploids as opposed to haploids. A haploid is just half the ploidy of whatever you started with, right? So if you have a, a diploid and you make a haploid, yes, that's a monoploid. If you're a tetraploid, you talk about haploids, you're talking about diploids. So double monoploids um, are, are uh, diploid individuals that are completely homozygous. So they got the reference genome of 840 megabases. And uh, there we go. And uh, it, when they started to do some alignments, they had a lot of back sequence data from this heterozygous diploid. And they were a lot, able to align about 55% of their back sequence data from the heterozygous diploid to the double monoploid reference. And when they tried to align the, the uh, two haplotypes, uh, <coughs> the two different uh, chromosomes, if you will, within the heterozygous diploid to each other, they could only align six megabases as opposed to 100 megabases. Um, basically, the conclusion is that the two chromosomes uh, in every homolo homology group within this heterozygous diploid were far more diverse from each other than they were from the double monoploid, which was uh, not particularly closely related. So that was already an inkling that we're dealing with just an incredible amount of sequence diversity in potato, and that really has been confirmed by this, uh, this paper I mentioned a moment ago, the Hardigan et al. from Robin Buell's group. Here's the plot from that, from that paper showing nucleotide diversity for a number of uh, seed-propagated crops, rice, soybean, tomato, cucumber, maize, and watermelon, and then potatoes there on the far right. And the, the light green bar is the nucleotide diversity of the wild accessions that they've studied. Um, and you can see even the wild potato accessions uh, exceed any of the other crops in terms of their sequence diversity. And what's particularly um, kind of sobering is to see cultivated tetraploid potato uh, barely takes a hit in terms of the sequence diversity as you compare that with what's happening in any other crop. So uh, we have an incredible genetic load in our cultivated germplasm that uh, we have to contend with when we do breeding. And I think this, this paper debunks, I think hopefully for good, the conventional wisdom that we suffer from a genetic bottleneck problem in, in the potato, uh, both in the US and, and more generally. It's true, we did have a, potentially a, a somewhat limited number of founders uh, for the US breeding effort 100, 120, 150 years ago, 
but the diversity already in those set of founders was, was just a tremendous amount of sequence diversity. And there has been a concerted effort to use the secondary gene pool in potato breeding in the United States, and, and we're seeing that reflected here. Okay, so uh, just a bit more about polyploy. We heard some of these terms yesterday from Augusto Garcia's talk. Classically, Stebbins uh, was one of the, the books that really cemented this idea of allo versus auto polyploids. And allo polyploid is one in which you have sexual hybridization of diverse species. And so the chromosomes are said to be homeologous because they uh, do not behave like homologous chromosomes in meiosis. And therefore, the, the, the inheritance pattern is said to be diasomic or like a diploid. In contrast, an autopolyploid is one which is presumably the result of the genome duplication, and then you really do have more than two sets of homologous chromosomes, and the inheritance patterns are different. It's said to be polysomic in its nature. This, uh, although nice uh, dichotomy, is really a simplification of reality. Uh, I would say current thinking in polyploid genetics, uh, let's see if my, there we go. Current thinking recognizes that there's actually a, a continuum between a true allopolyploid and a pure autopolyploid. So here's an example of this continuum. Potato is actually really quite close to the ideal of what an autopolyploid should behave like. An example of, of what a pure allo uh, tetraploid might be something like a tetraploid wheat or durum wheat, where either there is actually genetic control which suppresses pairing between homeologous chromosomes. And then we have things like rose uh, and peanut, which are somewhere in between these two extremes. And one way to parameterize this is to mathematically uh, estimate what is the probability of homeologous, homeologous, homeologous chromosomes pairing in meiosis one. Um, if it were a random process and you have one chromosome and there are three left, I'm talking about a tetraploid example, the probability of uh, selecting that homeolog, uh, the, the, the homeologous chromosome would be one third. And so you can say there's a deviation from that model this parameter rho, and so something like potato has a value of rho equals zero. Uh, in this very nice paper by Peter Bork and the group from Wageningen University, they actually use a software package I'll tell you about in a minute to estimate that parameter for tetraploid rows and find that for three of the uh, homology groups that they estimate values between 0.2 and 0.3 for that value. So there is some preferential pairing, as we say, uh, in tetraploid rows. At the other extreme, uh, the group at the University of Georgia, Scott Jackson and Peggy Ozias Aiken, uh, have shown that they can observe, uh, they can infer the presence of quadrivalence forming uh, <coughs> in their uh, peanut germplasm, and so we know that peanut is not a pure allotetraploid as it's been assumed for a long period of time. It shows some degree of tetrasomic inheritance. Um, okay, so let's now start to talk about markers. We heard quite a bit about this yesterday from Augusta Garcia, so I don't have to go into great detail, but the technology that we're primarily using is a SNP array, uh, thousands of markers on a microchip, and uh, the array gives you the, rel the relative intensity values for two different alleles, and if you uh, plot those in a Cartesian plot, you can see different clusters forming corresponding to the dosage, let's say, of uh, the allele B, where big A and big B are just designating the two different alleles at this particular SNP. Um, <clears throat> we often like to actually uh, look, at the fig look at the data in a different way. It's really the uh, angle here uh, that uh, conveys information about allele dosage, so you can convert this kind of a plot to just plot the polar angle theta, and then you see these bands that show up, and so the x-axis is just a sample identifier, and the y-axis is the um, the theta because it's really a univariate classification problem. And we heard about Supermassa yesterday. Uh, there's another software package called Fit Tetra. We've developed one in our group called Cluster Call. These are all, um, you know, these are all supervised learning algorithms that are designed to try and identify these clusters and then infer what is the allele dosage of that cluster. And when you have five clusters, it's relatively straightforward to infer that dosage. When you have fewer than the full number, you can see some of the phenomena that we saw yesterday, compression of the clusters, uh, and so additional information is frequently needed to then properly infer what the dosage would be. Uh, the software we use, uh, you use a F1 population where you know what the expected segregation ratio would be to more or less teach the software 
to learn the relationship between the theta and the dosage and then you can then project that information onto a diversity panel or breeding germ plasm for example the other technology that is used for uh, markers is genotyping by sequencing and <clears throat> we have done some of this as well in potato uh, and uh, and uh, as well as part of uh, uh, Matthias's uh, work and our group on the Uracloa. In this case, the allele count uh, is what you use to infer the allele, the allele dosage of the, the chromosomes. Um, the real problem is that you need a high read depth to differentiate which the three heterozygous genotypes in a tetraploid you're dealing with. Uh, you can just do some calculations from a binomial model and come up with these numbers that if you're trying to achieve 95% accuracy for your genotyping data, which corresponds to a GQ value of 13, which is not particularly high quality, and people often like to have more like a GQ of 20, which is 99% accuracy. But even with a GQ of 13, you need over 60 reads uh, in a tetraploid to differentiate the three different heterozygous groups compared to only six reads in a diploid to be able to differentiate your heterozygote from uh, the homozygous condition. So, um, and if you want 99% accuracy, you're looking at more like 100 reads per sample. So you've got to have a, a, a pretty good genome reduction protocol in place if you're going to be able to get that kind of read depth um, <clears throat> at the right price point. And frankly, we don't really have it uh, in potato despite a number of enzyme optimization studies that we've tried. So for that reason, the SNP array is really still our preferred technology that we're using as our workhorse for our breeding and our genetics work in potato. And just as a, um, an advertisement for anyone here who's working in potato and interested, the version four of our array is coming out next year. Um, and it's gonna have 35,000 markers. And the price for one sample is 40 to 45 US dollars, uh, depending upon your volume. So that's, a, that's an amazing uh, resource for, for potato breeding and genetics. So what can we do with something like a couple thousand or hopefully even a couple tens of thousands of, of markers in potato? The uh, couple different examples I'm gonna go through here, uh, one is linkage analysis, another is checking our pedigrees to make sure they are correct, uh, third, genome-wide association studies, and finally, genomic selection. So uh, <clears throat> one of the, I think, just fascinating things about what markers can do is they allow us to visualize some of the complexity of meiosis in something like uh, autotetraploid potato. And uh, here I'm showing you some figures from an F1 population in potato where we've used a software called Tetra Origin, which was developed by the biostatistics group at Wageningen University, and it will take a set of uh, a couple hundred markers per chromosome is good enough, and it will then infer the probability of descent of any of the parental homologs that have been inherited into your particular offspring. And you can look at this in this kind of a diagram, which color codes, um, in this case, I've color coded in blue the two maternally inherited chromosomes for this tetraploid individual. So each one of these, these are the four chromosomes of this uh, tetraploid clone. The two blue strips are the maternally inherited chromosomes and the two red, although it doesn't show up here, this is, a, a, uh, this, is this uh, color right here. This is the paternally inherited chromosomes. And what you can see is that you can visualize the recombination that occurred in, during meiosis when the gametes were formed that this individual inherited. So uh, this particular chromosome, there was a recombination event between this maternal homologue and this maternal homologue, and so the, the recombinant uh, homologue has this pattern. This maternally inherited chromosome was from a sister chromatid that did not have any recombination. Look at this paternally inherited chromosome here. You'll see three different shades of red, right? Uh, that can't happen unless you have uh, all four of the homologous chromosomes synapsing uh, in a structure called a quadrivalent uh, during meiosis. So we can see here directly that there was a quadrivalent formed in the meiosis that gave rise to this individual on the paternal side. We can also see uh, what is uh, considered the, one of the weirdest things that happens in polyploids is a phenomenon known as double reduction, which I hate that term because it's confusing. Um, but Basically, what it means is that the gamete contains portions of both sister chromatids from a particular homologue, uh, which again is something which doesn't happen in diploids. And that can be inferred by looking at this, look at these two maternally inherited chromosomes, and it doesn't show up that well here, but this is all this kind of lighter blue. So both of the maternally inherited chromosomes contain large portions 
that were derived from the same maternal homologue and it was from the two different sister chromatids that ended up in the same gamete and when you have a combination between chromosomes that are on the same side of the equatorial plane in meiosis one that's what gives rise to this possibility so we're learning something about meiosis and then practically we can take these kinds of probabilities and do QTL mapping studies one of the traits that we're very interested in potato is late blight which is infamous for causing the Irish potato famine um, and it's still a disease that is uh, worldwide and that we are actively breeding against. We are not allowed to actually do field trials, inoculated field trials of late blight in Wisconsin because of the potential risk to the commercial industry around us. So we do them in uh, a controlled greenhouse. Here's a picture of what late blight will do to a potato plant in about seven days. Um, if it's susceptible, it completely destroys the foliage. Uh, what's remarkable is that we have plants like this. This is a uh, new release from a colleague of mine, a extremely resistant potato to late blight. We don't know what the resistance gene is yet. We're in the process of trying to map it. And uh, here's an example of an earlier mapping study that we did that uh, shows that we can in fact do this with the markers and the methods that we have now. This was a cross between a late blight resistant potato named Toyokin uh, and a susceptible variety there on the right. And uh, <clears throat> by uh, basically doing a regression analysis on these IBD probabilities using uh, a random effects model, which is an idea I actually got from uh, Guilherme uh, De Silva, former member of, our, of uh, your group here, who's now in North Carolina State. He gave a talk about this idea, and I thought this is a brilliant idea to try and deal with the complexity of having a large number of parental alleles in your model. So this is a random effects model, which we can get a lot score, and we can see we can map where that resistance gene is on chromosome nine, and then you can further go and then look at the estimates of the effects of each of the eight parental alleles, and only one of the homologs, which is in this case the M3 chromosome, the third chromosome in the maternal parent, uh, has a homolog effect that is significantly different than zero, and so we can determine that that is present in a single dose in the maternal parent. So we're getting, we can, est we can map these and we can determine their dosage with this, and we're using this technology now to tackle a large number of problems where there's large effect genes in our, in our populations. Um, pedigrees, so any breeding program knows that there are errors in your pedigrees. It's just inevitable when you manage the, uh, a very complex uh, organization. Uh, <clears throat> one way to check this that we've been using in potato is to make a plot of two different uh, quantities. The x-axis is the the uh, estimated relation, additive relationship based on a pedigree, which should be, say, 0.5 between a parent and an offspring in the absence of inbreeding. Uh, and you can then make a plot of the estimated relationship from a set of genome-wide markers, and the symbol for that is typically G. And uh, this is for a particular clone. This is the name of the clone, and this is the recorded parentage. And if everything is as it should be, your recorded parent should show up in the upper right corner of this diagram. They should have the highest additive relationship and the high uh, from the pedigree and from the markers should be in agreement. You should get this nice positive correlation. Uh, these are the two parents. They're right where they should be. This is actually a full sibling. It's about where it should be. So in this case, I would say we have the right pedigree for this particular clone. Here's an example, which we see unfortunately more than I would like, where clearly we don't have agreement between our pedigree and our marker data. <clears throat> the recorded parents are Ivory Crisp and Marcy. And here is Ivory Crisp and Marcy, which are at a high value of A, as they should be from the pedigree data, but then when you look at their G value, it's basically around zero, so they're the same degree of relationship as everything else in the population. So there's two possible interpretations. One is that uh, we didn't genotype the clone we thought we genotyped, we made a mistake when we genotyped it somehow, which happens, or the pedigree information is wrong. Either way, the clone that we did genotype, you can look at this and you can say, what are these two individuals way out here? They have apparently very little pedigree relationship, but they're the most related individuals in the whole data set to this clone. These are the parents of this individual right here. Uh, and so we can now start to correct our pedigrees. And it is something of an iterative process. You don't know what to believe initially, but once you get a set of self-consistent clones, you can build out your network and have confidence. And so now we have enough data that uh, we've been able to correct the pedigrees of over 30 clones, including a number of released potato varieties in the United States, and here's a reference that tells you more about that, that story. Okay, uh, GWAS. <clears throat> um, GWAS, of course, is a, one of the workhorses of trying to understand, uh, do variant discovery in diversity panels and breeding germplasm, and uh, you can actually trick a diploid software to do GWAS in a polyploid if you just rescale 
your uh, dosage data so that it ranges between zero and two, for example, if you're working with a software package which allows fractional genotypes, not all of them do. But if you did that, it would compress your data down to uh, zero to two with fractional values for some of the intermediate dosages. And that, that works. The, the disadvantage is that you could only test for an additive association if that's your approach. So, we, and we thought, well, seems likely that we might have some dominance type of associations that we want to test for. So we developed a, a basically just a, a wrapper around an older GWAS um, engine that I had written in the R blub package, so which has an interface that works with polyploids, and we called it GWAS Poly. This is work done with the postdoc and my former postdoc in my group, Umesh Rosyara, and it can basically test for all kinds of dominance models that you can imagine. Some that probably don't even really exist in the real world, but mathematically they're possible. Uh, and you can get QQ plots and Manhattan plots and do kinds of permutation tests. Um, and so, one thing we did when we published this was we just showed kind of what you would expect if you simulate different kinds of genetic architecture, if you simulate uh, additive genetic architecture, a simplex dominant, a duplex dominant, and then you use different models. When you use the right model, you get the best performance out of the software in terms of statistical power and low false positive rate if you select the model that matches the true underlying architecture. So you can try different models and see which one of them gives you best results in your, in your data set. Um, here's just an example of two traits that we've tried. Uh, I actually don't do a lot of GWAS anymore. I'm more interested in linkage mapping, so I don't have a lot of exciting examples, but this paper has been cited about 25 times already, so uh, a lot of different groups are using this now um, to do their analyses. Okay, now let's come to the main thing I spend a lot of my time working on is genomic selection. Uh, genomic selection, we've heard a bit about. It's a technique for using predictions based on markers, especially useful for polygenic traits. Um, and the real excitement is because it should allow you to shorten your breeding cycle without losing prediction accuracy. Um, you can shorten your breeding cycle even in phenotypic selection. We heard a bit, some ideas about that. But if you do that, typically you are not as accurate in your selection of the genetic merit of those individuals. And the idea with genomic selection is that you can have, you can have it both ways. You can get less, shorten your cycle, and maintain your accuracy. Um, so that's what we're trying to do in Potato. The other nice thing about using genomic selection compared to phenotypic selection is that it allows you to select only the, the additive portion of the genetic merit, which in something like Potato, one would think would be an actually really important aspect of how genomic selection would be improved because if you're only selecting on phenotypes, right, the phenotype is, uh, contains the full genotypic value plus um, environmental terms and that only a portion of the full genotypic value is efficiently transmitted. Here is the uh, classical expression for the covariance between a parent and offspring, um, <clears throat> which is true for any ploidy level. For any ploidy level, uh, it's one half the additive genetic variance plus one fourth the additive by additive genetic variance, and then the coefficient of the dominance genetic variance depends upon your ploidy level. In diploids, that coefficient C is zero, so there is no um, influence of dominance genetic variance when you look at parent offspring relationships in diploids. In potatoes, it's one-sixth. In uh, hexaploids, it's one-fifth, and so on. Um, <clears throat> now, the, uh, so this come, raises a, a, a point about terminology if the, co if the uh, Covariance between parent and offspring involves dominance genetic variance. What is the proper use of the term breeding value? Um, and we still use the term breeding value more or less synonymously with additive portion of the genetic variance. It's the same reason that we do that in diploids, because in diploids, actually, additive by additive epistasis is also part of the breeding value. And yet, we don't typically think about that when we talk about breeding values in diploids. And the reason being that <clears throat> over time, the contribution of the higher order, the non-additive terms decreases geometrically. Um, it's a power of, uh, decreases with a proportion of one half in the case relative to additive for the epistasis. It decreases with a, with a, a base of one third raised to however many generations you are moving out. So even when you're thinking about non-additive variants, it's still appropriate to try and focus on selecting on the additive portion if you're trying to think about long-term genetic gain. Um, one of the things that uh, we've worked on that is trying to understand how do you actually realize some of these classical theories uh, with genomic marker data. 
Um, Cam Thorne had a, just an amazing set of papers in 1955 where he pretty much solved the problem classically for any ploidy level. <coughs> um, and the basic idea is this, that uh, an additive effect, the, the technical definition of it is it's uh, the, the result of a regression of your genotypic value on your allele dosage. And whatever the residual from that regression is known as the dominance deviation. And that is a concept which holds regardless of the ploidy. In a diploid, there's only a single uh, dominance deviation for every pair of genes because there's only two of them present uh, in a diploid. In polyploids, you have a hierarchy of dominance deviations, which can be understood by a successive process of regress regression on higher order terms. And you produce something like this kind of an equation. In the case of a tetraploid, the genotypic value relative to the, pop to the population mean has, in the case of a tetraploid, has four additive effects. Uh, the different subscripts correspond to the four different homologous chromosomes. There are six diagenic dominance effects because there are six ways of choosing two from a set of four. There are four trigenic and one quadrigenic term. Um, I'm gonna focus here on the additive and the diagenic dominance portion of this. And the symbol I'll use is U for additive and for diagenic dominance, the sum of all those betas, I'm gonna use the symbol V for to denote the total diagenic dominance. And um, what we show in this paper that came out a few months ago is that uh, if you have a, a set of allele dosage information or you have a matrix uh, X, which is your matrix of the rows being the clones of your, of your population and the columns being your markers, and you encode these, for example, with this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 allele dosage coding. <clears throat> if you can define a matrix W, which looks a lot like the diploid, um, example, you basically subtract the mean of each marker away from that, and you can construct a, the variance-covariance matrix for the additive effects or the breeding values is this uh, W times W transpose, and that's rescaled to be this matrix G. That's more or less the same as the diploid result um, with a different scaling. What's unique about what we did was to actually show that to get the variance-covariance matrix for the diagenic dominance terms, you need to construct this expression, which it is a quadratic expression, whereas the, um, the, uh, for the additive terms, you have a first-order expression with respect to the allele dosage, and you get then, however, the same basic mathematical structure. You have a Q matrix times its transpose, and you can go on to higher order terms that way. So um, let's look at this with some real data. The potato data set has 570 clones. Uh, it comes from a national chip processing trial, so the round white types, and as well as from our own breeding program, about almost 4,000 SNPs. We've got uh, six years of uh, data for a couple different traits. One of the first things we wanted to do is make sure that the assumption of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium was valid because that is one of the assumptions of the classical theory of average effects, although there are new methods that uh, relax that assumption. But this one uses that assumption, and you can just make a plot here of heterozygote frequency on the y-axis versus allele frequency on the x-axis. And the solid black line is the expectation under panmixis and the dash for a tetraploid, and the dashed line is the expectation under panmixis for a diploid. So we're pretty much right on the money in terms of the, uh, the assumptions. And the other way you can just check that is by looking at the average value of the diagonal elements of these matrices, which should be one uh, under the assumptions of, of panmixis. And they are pretty much right there for this data set. Um, <clears throat> I showed earlier this idea of plotting the G versus the A values for one particular clone. You can also do that for all pairs of clones in your data set, and uh, you get uh, something like this. If you're, if you've, this didn't look this way when I started this data set, we had points everywhere. So after doing all the pedigree corrections, now we finally get uh, a result that looks right. There's a nice linear relationship between G and A if you look at all pairs. Um, this is a plot of the diagenic dominance matrix against G, and you can see it, uh, it really, there is definitely some degree of collinearity between those two matrices at high degree of relationship, but uh, there is still quite a bit of orthogon orthogonality for most of the, the data points. And you can use these then to do a mixed model analysis since you have different covariance matrices, you can estimate variance components. And here's showing um, the partitioning of genetic variance for this particular data set. And these are two different traits, yield and specific gravity, which is basically dry matter. 
And we have a series of models that we've tested, and you can look at how the variance is partitioned. Um, maybe I won't spend a lot of time going into this other than to point out that the yellow, which is the, the dominance portion, is surprisingly little. I really expected to see a lot more genetic variance uh, due to the diagenic dominance, and we're not seeing it in, in these data sets, and I don't really have a good explanation for why that is. Um, we also did throw in this additive by additive epistasis matrix using the Hadamard product, um, and in the case of specific gravity, it does appear to take up quite a bit of the variance when you include it in the model, that's this purple portion. Um, if you look at the AIC, however, uh, you, you see that uh, the AIC basically suggests that this is not as strongly, that those estimates are not strongly constrained by the data. Um, so I would conclude that, uh, that uh, we really don't know to what extent additive by additive epistasis is playing a role in the non-additive genetic variance here. Uh, I was pretty happy with the size of this data set, 570 clones, but it's clear that we're gonna have to get bigger data sets if we really want to start to partition some of these variances with, uh, with some confidence. Uh, of course, we wanna make predictions that we can use for breeding, and here's uh, some figures showing how prediction accuracy increases as we increase the size of our training population for the different traits that we studied, and um, we're hoping to still, again, get uh, bigger accuracies and improve on this. The uh, non-additive terms in the model don't really contribute much to the prediction accuracy in the exercises that we've done. One of the interesting results is to then see, ask the question, we spent all this time and money trying to make sure we had a marker technology that allowed us to estimate allele dosage uh, <clears throat> with a high degree of accuracy. Does it really help with the predictions to know whether you're talking about a one dose versus a two dose or a three dose heterozygote? One way you can try and test that idea is to take your nice allele dosage data and collapse it down, which we call diplodizing. So you recode it and all three of the heterozygotes get converted down to essentially a single heterozygous class. And then you just apply the diploid machinery to do the predictions and here's the result of doing that for a set of different uh, uh, unselected F1 populations. The red bar is the prediction accuracy for the diplodized data, and the blue bar is the prediction accuracy with the low dosage data. And it's undeniable that uh, we have very significant improvement in our prediction accuracies across traits and populations when we have access to our low dosage data. So uh, I think it is, it is worthwhile to continue working with markers that have that information. All right, the last uh, thing here, which I don't know if I will I think I might probably have a little bit of time. I'll just quickly go through this last example because I, I promised Natalia I would throw a slide in about G by E. I'm not sure where she, not, not that Natalia, the other Natalia, but both of you are into G by E. Um, the, uh, this is an example from uh, PhD student Carrie schmitz Carly. It just, uh, just appeared online a few weeks ago in crop science. So I mentioned we have all these different breeding programs. We share germplasm and we test each other's material and then we get data, we get many um, site years worth of data in one calendar year. It's a very powerful way of trying to leverage our resources. And of course, sometimes you develop, you breed a variety in Wisconsin and it happens to do better in a different part of the country. And so then uh, sometimes things become commercially successful in different states than where they were developed. Uh, this is the set of locations that we had data to, for, for this national chip processing trial. <coughs> and um, we analyzed that set of uh, data for a couple different traits and Basically, the goal was to just estimate the genetic correlation between these different locations as a kind of first uh, step towards building correlated trait prediction models. We wanted to know what kind of genetic correlations are we even dealing with here. And uh, when you have, this is 40 different environments, so we have a 40 by 40 matrix uh, of correlations. That's a huge number of parameters to estimate. You can't do it reliably. You've got to use some type of uh, parsimony principle to try and use a reduced uh, number of parameters. And the most common method that people are using now is this so-called factor analytic structure, which invokes a set of hidden latent factors. Um, and in this case, we have, we, you can use AIC or other metrics to identify what's the optimal number of latent factors. In this case, for yield, in this data set, it was four. So we have four latent factors. And we can ask the question, for these different states that we have, what proportion of the genetic variance is actually captured by this um, factor analytic model, because again, anytime you reduce the complexity, you improve the fit, but you then may lose some of the information that's present there. And it seems to do a reasonably good job for every state except for Florida. This is the 
This is the proportion of the genetic variance explained. One up here at the, at the top. Most of the states are looking pretty good. Florida just, just way off the chart in terms of, it does not seem to be well described by, by, this, um, by this model. And uh, another type of view that I think is informative is to ask the question, take the average correlation between all the environments at a single location, which is some measure of like the coherence of the environments at one location, is there a consistent expression of gene genetic potential at a location over time versus the average correlation between environments but, um, between a particular location and all other locations? So if the particular location is some kind of a unique microenvironment, it should have a high x-axis value and a low y-axis value. And there actually is one state that meets that criterion here, and it's Texas, my home state as it turns out. Texas has a very high relatively speaking, the same degree of correlation between the environments at its own location as everything else, but it has a very low degree of correlation between the environments at all the other locations. So it is something like its own uh, mega or micro environment relative to the other states in our data set. And then the last slide here I have is just another visualization technique. Um, <clears throat> Ultimately, you want to try and understand something about the, again, the degree of genetic correlation between your state and all the other states. And, and when you have this 40 by 40 matrix of correlations, that can be a difficult thing to visualize and you can try hierarchical clustering and a lot of other techniques. But one thing we found that seems to be useful is to use a, a method known as linear discriminant analysis, which is a, it, it sounds maybe like principal component analysis and they are uh, related in a sense. Whereas principal component analysis tries to rotate your data to um, find the, the directions that maximize the, uh, the total variance, if you will, the sum of squares in that direction. This is a, uses a grouping factor and it tries to find the direction that ma minimizes, uh, it maximizes the sum of squares, uh, let me say, minimizes the sum of squares within the location relative to the sum of squares across locations. It's trying to find a projection or rotation that compresses all the environments for one location relative to all the other locations. And since location is the repeatable part of this, whereas time is not repeatable, this is a useful way of parsing your data. Uh, so here example, the first linear discriminant is the direction that creates the most separation between the locations. And um, kind of what you would expect based on what I just showed a moment ago, this triangle, which is each of the points here, is three different years, all from Texas that the, the uh, separation which puts Texas in its own group is what you observe on the first linear discriminant. And then the second linear discriminant kind of pulls out some of our southern locations from our northern locations, but it's really not a very interpretable, uh, I would say, dimension for this technique. But the, con the practical conclusion is that we do have a number of other states which have a reasonably high genetic correlation. So we are moving forward with the idea of trying to use these data from other locations as correlated traits to improve our prediction accuracy in Wisconsin. So with that, I will conclude and just say that uh, um, potato has some challenges from a breeding perspective due to its polyploid and asexually propagated nature. We have a high genetic load and, and uh, I think that's part of why potato breeding um, has made progress in some areas and maybe other areas not so much. Um, we have new software and now these markers. We really, I think, are primed to, to do a lot of, uh, to accelerate genetic gain in potato breeding at the tetraploid level. And the question is, will that be good enough? I mean, we can all make up slides about the growing need for, for food in this, uh, in the world and whether we'll be good enough to do that in tetraploid potato is an open question. So a lot of my colleagues and myself are actually revisiting the idea of breeding at the diploid level by extracting haploids, trying to inbreed them, um, and that's a 20 to 30 year process, we know, so uh, it's gonna be an exciting time, both for tetraploid and diploid potato breeding in the next several decades. So with that, I'll thank you and uh, take any questions if there's time. Thank you, Prof. Professor Endemon, for the great lecture. And now we are open to questions.
question was what's unique about the texas microenvironment and uh, at this point i could speculate it uh, it is a very hot environment but there are other locations that also have probably a similar degree of heat stress so uh, we don't know what we what we really need to do is is to do some virotyping we need to try and um, go the next step and not just treat each location as a as a black box a level of a factor look at the uh, the weather station data and try and understand our environments more deeply. But that's, that's where we need to go. So my question um, on your um, variance analysis. Uh, so your, on your variance analysis, are those clones a diverse sampling of different potato types? Or is that a, a particular 570 clones that you have? Are those the, the the partitioning of the genetic yeah, variants? Yeah. Those are all from the round white breeding category. So how much of that um, reallocation of the non-additive um, variants or, or what you cannot find can be just caused by the fact that these are those selected clones that have undergone I mean, a lot of that epistatic interaction might just show up at, as additive interaction because it has been selected as the combination. Have you have you tried that same type of analysis using combinations of clones that might not have necessarily the same epistatic relationships through selection? The yes, the clone for for the trait specific gravity that did show that large epistatic variance. Uh, I would say that is a trait for which that those set of clones have been selected um, for yield. Probably the selection that we've done has not been very effective and. So I, I think you're right that uh, certainly the selection history of that can influence the partitioning of genetic variants. I mean, the, the genetic variance is not a, a concept that can be articulated in the absence of reference to a specific population and its history. And, and as we try and do more analysis like this, maybe we'll learn something about how selection is affecting the partitioning of genetic variants. I think that's what I understand you're getting at. I think that's, that's right on. So, so, but have you tried a similar analysis using combinations of clones from these different groups? Or is always, you've done it within potato classes? Uh, we, yeah, part of the problem is that the, the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium break down when we start to combine them across different groups. So uh, I haven't quite figured out the right way of doing that, but uh, we, need to, we need to try and understand how we can do those kinds of analyses. Any more questions? No? So, thank you, Professor. We have that gift for you. I would like to invite